Hey everyone, this is Carlos. I'm the founder and CEO at Product School. And today I'm here with Nick Caldwell, who is the VP of Engineering at Twitter. Hey, Nick. Hey, Carlos. Thanks for the invite. Man, the, by the way, I was watching that intro video. The production value has radically increased since the last time I did one of these talks. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and live up to that. Well, like, product management is becoming hot. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we're live streaming on Twitter. Um, but let's start from the beginning, Nick. Like I, I saw that you've, you, you've worked in product engineering. You've also had a GM role at companies such as Microsoft, Reddit, Google, Looker, and now Twitter. But how did you get started? Tell me a bit more about you before you broke into product. Oh, wow. Like how, where do you want to start? I mean, I'll, I'll go way back in the day. I mean, I've, I've been a lifelong, uh, you know, uh, you know, passionate about technology in general. I grew up in PG County, Maryland, which is a, a 90 plus percent black suburb to the southeast of DC. Um, my dad was a uh, public defender and he used to do all of his work on a, uh, ta on a typewriter. <laughs> and one day he brought home a uh, Tandy 1000, like one of the first uh, personal computers. So I used to sit on his lap and like pretend to type. Uh, and, uh, you know, unfortunately I didn't break anything. Uh, and that, you know, led to like sort of an early fascination with computers, uh, you know, starting with gaming, of course, you know, playing Wolf 3D and Doom and, uh, you know, getting involved in the early internet scene, bulletin board systems. Those gave me access to, you know, a wide variety of people and opportunities that I wouldn't have otherwise been exposed to. Uh, and it went from there. Like I, I got into ML, AI, taught myself C++. And so on and so forth, um, and uh, took me far and far and away from uh, from B PG County, Maryland, to uh, school at MIT, and then to a, a job on the other coast at Microsoft in Seattle. Uh, and uh, you know, then I waited way too long in that role, uh, and uh, eventually made my way to the to the Bay Area startup scene, which uh, which has been absolutely fascinating in the, in the past uh, six years that uh, me and my wife have uh, have moved down here. And. There's something that um, caught my interest in your, your LinkedIn profile is that you ended up becoming a general manager, Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And from there, you've also taken on roles related to product, then engineering. So how do you think about the intersection between all, all of that? Well, yeah, no, I was very fortunate in my career at Microsoft. For, for those of y'all who aren't familiar with Microsoft, like it is very, very heavy on the general management uh, role as you climb up the ranks. So, uh, you know, I, you get, you, uh, the higher you get at that company, the, the more exposed you are to different aspects of the business, to the point where you, you know, are asked to inherit and run teams uh, and eventually, you know, own entire uh, business lines. Um, so, uh, you know, while I was at Microsoft and in, in other roles, I've run product engineering, uh, design, product marketing, like primarily focused on the R&D side of the house, less on the, on the go-to-market side of the house. Um, the uh, the intersection, I guess, between the, the product and inside, which, which is what I, I think your actual question was, Carlos, sorry, I'm just rambling at you about, you know, <laughs> Microsoft. But yeah, no, bo both roles, uh, product and engineering, they care obviously very very much about the product and, and what's being built. Um, both roles care about, uh, uh, both roles, it helps to have an understanding of technology and what's possible. Both roles care about people. I, I think the differences are important, though. Um, and it maybe comes down to what sort of people <laughs> each of these groups care about and, and why it matters to the success of the overall team. So um, both of these groups, engine product, have very uh, uh, important and different constituents. Like product folks, their constituents are customers, like all the cross-functional teams that it takes to go into, uh, uh, into product creation, the sales team to, to interface with the go-to-market. Like you're dealing with like a very, very wide variety of functions, customers, et cetera, and trying to synthesize that into product strategy, product roadmap, uh, et cetera, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, engineers also, uh, engineering leaders also have uh, a, a large number of constituents, but they're primarily engineers. And like being able to cat herd large numbers of engineers is a, is a skill in, in, in and of itself. Engineers need, you know, there's an intersection there. Engineers like product need vision, motivation. They need to understand the mission and the why about what they're doing. Um, but like any other function, engineering also has its own sort of way of working. And, um, you know, I think engineers tend to be, uh, it's, it's not like a, when you're in engineering, you're not like at a, 
work in a factory line. It's not like your, your job is to sit there and like put beans in a can. It isn't like a very, very straightforward robotic exercise. It's much more like craftsmanship, but it has to be done at scale with predictability uh, and quality. And as an engineering manager, you're trying to uh, coerce all of these teams, these, these teams of craftspeople into, into building on a schedule to whatever the, the broader vision is. So you're, so managing that constituency becomes your, uh, your, your primary job. So I'll leave it there. Yeah, and, and it's refreshing to see um, that you were able to understand both sides of the equation and kind of jumping between them. Because I've seen other, other situations where there, there are silos created because products tends to be more business driven and assumes that engineering is just executing what the product says and, and engineering thinks that they know how to do things and that they're receiving orders from people who actually don't know how to build stuff. So <laughs> I think getting both minds right, I think it's, it's valuable for the entire team. Yeah, that's the worst when when the disciplines aren't talking to each other. Like you don't build the best products unless you, you pull in all the the uh, different opinions and, and insights and, and figure out a way to best synthesize them. Like, and I, I do I would say on the whole, like product a product person who doesn't know how to do that synthesis is, is not going to be very effective. Like you have to know how to learn. You have to learn how to talk to each of the stakeholders in a way that aligns with um, how they not just how they like to be spoken to, but the, that aligns with their goals and their and their outcomes and OKRs. Like marketing people, engineers, salespeople, all are, are literally gold on different things. And so you as the product person sitting between all of these folks, it really helps and is important to understand like what their motivations are before you go talk to them and, and try and get them bought into whatever strategy or mission is. Well, something that I'm very curious about is when you rise through the ranks to a point where your product is not only what the users see, but also your team, and you are in charge of really nurturing a culture of collaboration. What are some, and, and there's no right or wrong answer, right? Like there are different cultures and they are examples of different cultures being successful. But I can imagine that Microsoft culture, Reddit culture, or Twitter culture are different. So it, it would be great if you could tell us a little more about how <laughs> to think about building a product culture. Yeah, no, that's absolutely the case. Um, any any company has any company you drop into is going to have culture and leadership values that indirectly are influenced by their customer base and whatever their product is and their history. I mean that is what culture is. Um, culture is essentially the um, accumulation over time of what behaviors you reward and punish. I mean that's the I guess the textbook <laughs> definition of it. And so Microsoft has a, a long history of, of being very competitive. Um, Twitter, I don't even know how to describe Twitter's culture. Is it any company that works in social media, uh, social media companies tend to be about authenticity. So I worked at Reddit as well and, and Twitter as well. And internally, like we highly value and reward people who are authentic and bringing their, their true selves into the into the workplace. Um, you know, I spent some time at Google. Uh, they, they're, you know, when you join, they give you like a propeller head hat. So they're, <laughs> they, they reward sort of people who are more... Uh, I want to say nerdy, but <laughs> tech, tech, it's, a, it's a much more of a te technocratic sort of culture over there. Um, the main thing though is like, you know, any of, the, any of these things can work. It depends on, on what your, your product in, environment is and, and being open to iterating your culture to match whatever your, your present day challenges might happen to be. Now, uh, that leaves a lot of room for interpretation. So, uh, you know, if, if I had to give you some guidance on how to, you know, build a, a product and edge culture that works well, I mean, if you need a starting place, uh, I think, uh, you know, encouraging people to be uh, fearless, like, you know, don't, don't worry about taking risk, um, you know, uh, being okay, going into new areas and seeing what happens, having some uh, accommodation for, uh, for trying new things. I don't want to say failure, because I think like, you know, I, I, I think I, actually disagree with just being okay with failure. You should have a success plan in mind. And, and maybe if, if it fails, like you, you, you iterate, but uh, don't aim for failure, aim for success. Um, you know, allowing people uh, to uh, uh, not have to, to have artificial boundaries. And, and in my mind, there are a lot of artificial boundaries when it comes to, uh, to building product or, or the way that we work. A lot of these boundaries are put up to give us structure and, and, and predictability and familiarity, but they can also be limiting factors. 
And, uh, you know, you, you, I, we talked earlier about switching between product and, and engineering, right? Imagine if I had put a boundary on myself that like, oh, I'm an engineer, so I'm never going to care about product. Well, my career would have been nowhere near as successful as it, as it has been. And, and I've had a couple W's in my book. So um, now apply that to entire organizations. If, if you go to your organization and say, um, you know, limit what you can think about or, or, or limit how much impact you can have on a particular business line that might already exist, you're just narrowing the scope of what's possible. So you should not, uh, not, not don't place too many artificial boundaries on your team. And, uh, you know, just to wrap it up, because I could go on with this, but like the other, the other thing is, um, you know, it, it, having a, a genuine appreciation for teamwork makes a lot of things easier. And there are cultures uh, that you can work in where you're maybe more motivated toward individual performance, or maybe even re more rewarded for individual performance. Thinking about systems and, and putting re reward mechanics in place that uh, elevate teams and allow people to succeed together uh, can can have some really outsized uh, outcomes in, uh, in a lot of different dimensions. Uh, you know, better team cohesion, more creativity, uh, people people you know f filling gaps in terms of supporting each other. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. I could I could go on. There's you could you could do a whole hour talk on what good culture is. I'm I'm passionate about that topic because I think it gets to a point where it's more about people than actually the the, the technology that we use and. There's so many ways to go about it. And I, I take one thing that you said, which is that do not self-react and assume that you cannot do something because if you assume you cannot do something, that's probably true. But if you can assume that you can do something, that's probably true as well. Absolutely. All, all these boundaries we put up are usually artificial. Like they may be there for you know, a reason, maybe to correct some mistake in the past, but you should always, always question, like, why is this boundary here? Is it something that I can overcome? Uh, and oftentimes the answer is yes. Uh, so... Um, you know, just, just remember, like, don't put artificial limits on yourself. It causes lots of downstream problems. So, you know, we're always saying product and engineering that we have to fall in love with the problem and not the solution. So what are some of those big, big problems that you are passionate about solving? Oh, uh, okay. So, wow. Uh, let me narrow it down. Uh, <laughs> I, I think career-wise, there's two things I found most interesting. I've, I've spent most of my career working in data and data engineering and BI space. So I, my um, big thing at, at Microsoft was uh, this product called Power BI. Uh, and then fast forward later, uh, several years later, I was the chief product officer at a company called Looker, uh, which got acquired by uh, uh, Google. And, and, and both of those cases, the thing that made us successful was that we were trying to, to make data uh, available in, in an operational way. Uh, that is to say, um, even though data can be challenging and, and you can do all this kind of crazy, cool forecasting and analysis and machine learning, but ultimately none of this stuff matters unless like a normal person can get something done with it. Where, where normal doesn't mean like you have to go learn SQL. Like normal people don't learn SQL. Like normal people are like school teachers or you know plumbers, like actual normal people. And, um, and both in Power BI and, and Looker, we strove to build um, a data platform that would sort of uh, collect all the data, make it simple, but ultimately allow you to build applications and services for everyday people. And that that is what allowed us to be successful. So that's that's one thing, and I think that's still a, a very important uh, trend in the market right now. Um, the other one, uh, the other side of my career has been, you know, Reddit and Twitter, um, social media. And uh, there's so many ch product challenges and, and societal challenges in social media. Uh, I think the, the, L the essence of it is, like, if you get, you know, let me put a pithy, a, a pithy way to say it is, like, large numbers of people kind of suck. And um, <laughs> trying to figure out ways to build products that keep large numbers of people interacting together uh, you know, healthy and safe in a way that is positive and good for the world is, is a fundamentally hard uh, problem that all social media companies struggle with in, in some way, shape or form. So um, that's something that's been, uh, you know, pretty exciting uh, for me, both uh, at Reddit and, and Twitter. Yeah, and I think in a way, both things that you said connect because the bigger those communities become on social media, the harder it is to to say something that is going to be liked by everyone. And so <laughs> to the relevance of data to understand how to target specific groups just to make sure that they feel engaged and not too overwhelmed by other content out there must be incredible. 
Well, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of work that goes into relevance and personalization, but that can also have some counter effects where, you know, you can create echo chambers and, you know, people start uh, maybe amplifying ideas that aren't good. So it, it's a very, very challenging uh, problem. And, you know, if you think about the place where we're in, in the world right now, social media um, uh, is sort of, uh, sorry, let me, let me give you the historical context. If you think about like every couple generations, we get sort of a transformative uh, change in how we communicate with one another, like printing press, radio, television, um, you know, dot, 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 all the way up to social media. And every, every one of these advancements has allowed um, individuals to reach a larger number of people more quickly. And each one has been sort of followed by, uh, you know, for lack of a better phrasing, like, you know, turmoil and upheaval, <laughs> like, like, you know, giving giving people access to this these sorts of uh, technologies that allow them to extend their reach often immediately has consequences that need to, uh, to be sorted through. And I, I think that is uh, uh, super interesting. One of the biggest challenges of, of our times. I used to think it was the biggest challenges until like all the stuff started happening with NFTs. And, and now I, I'm willing to admit I could be wrong because I have no idea what the hell's going on with NFTs. So I, I rever reserve judgment on that. <laughs> Um, let's actually double click on on what's next because I so I'm thinking about a company like Twitter. So obviously you have product market fit. There is there is a product that a lot of people love, use every day. So it gets to a point where as a leader you are thinking about allocating resources to you know in nurturing your core business while at the same time innovating in other areas that we don't know, right? Like and this could be one, but I'm just going to talk about spaces right? like audio. Because oh, sure. not so long ago, this wasn't a thing. And now suddenly we see ourselves on Clubhouse, Reddit Talks, Twitter Spaces, <laughs> Spotify has a thing. And like, how are you able to really kind of react or plan ahead and, and really spin out something that fast while maintaining the core? Well, I want to tell you, Carlos, as a uh, product visionaire, I predicted the social audio space years ago. <laughs> Yeah, sure. I had no idea this was coming down the pipe. I, so, um, I, 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 this is one of the things I'm really proud about uh, Twitter. That is to say, in the in the uh, maybe back half of, of last year, about a year ago, uh, we we saw you know growth in this space. Obviously, with Clubhouse, um, but not just Clubhouse. I mean, there were lots of different apps, as you said, that were starting to get in the social audio space. And um, you know, if you if we were at a, a bigger, slower moving company, we might have waited to just see how the whole space shook out. Uh, but um, I, by the way, I'm not the product guy. I need to give credit to Kayvon, who's our, our actual product guy. So I'm going to be speaking somewhat on his behalf. But yeah, he sort of saw this trend emerging and was like, hey, look, like we have some of the technical pieces around and some of the expertise on the product side laying around from a, a previous acquisition with Periscope. Maybe we can... Um, you know, if we rejigger our organization, like jump into this and make a really, really big impact quickly. And, um, you know, he, he, he was right. Like that, the, the, the team of the spaces team at Twitter did not effectively exist in January of this year. And we were able to get sort of a core group of people. We sort of dissected the necessary skill sets and, and uh, folks you would need both on the edge and go to market side and like threw it together really quickly. Uh, more experienced, uh, you know, folks like myself who have done other rapid org designs worked with that team to make sure that they had a, a strong growth plan. We cleared the decks on, um, you know, if, if you've worked at a, ever worked at a sizable company, you try and bring in third party technologies, you, you know, you go procurement and budgeting and we sort of like cut all that red tape. And then within about, I would say, uh, two to three months, um, you know, they they had put together like an extremely competitive sort of uh, you know, starting point platform that they've just been iterating on ever since. And then, you know, as with that initial success comes the go-to-market functions and the content partnerships and so on and so forth. And whew, I'm proud of the team. I've, I, in my career, I've shipped a lot of stuff pretty fast. Like that Power, Power BI is, a, is now a, a multi-billion dollar business. And that took us about a year and a half to go from standing start to, to launch uh, spaces. I mean, hey, you know, with fewer people, fewer resources, like, like going really fast. So I'm, I'm optimistic about that. And the, it says a lot about the company. We're, we're willing to take these very big high beta bets while simultaneously growing the, the core business, which I like. I mean, I, 
I spent most of my career on the startup side and I know two to three months is actually a very short period of time to ship something. So I can't only imagine what it is at a much larger organization if you have to add other layers of complexity and compliance, as you said. Yeah, no, I, I got to give credit to the team. Like all I can do is cut red tape and make it easy, but like it takes passionate people who like really love the idea. And if you, if you, you know, I wish I could have invited some of these folks, but like if you talk to them, you'll understand this isn't like a catch up with Clubhouse or kind of thing. They really believe that the, the future of, um, you know, in the future of social audio, uh, you know, in their bones. So they want to be market leaders. And like the fact that the, um, you know, overall market tailwinds, you know, put some wind in their sails, it really only amplified passion that pre-existed. And, you know, you can't get uh, any better starting point than that. Smart people, well-resourced and market tailwinds, oof, I'll bet on that, you know, every every day of the week. And now I started seeing more and more um, innovation in terms of like newsletter products. Uh, you mentioned payments or, in, uh, well, not, you didn't mention payments, you mentioned NFTs, but like there's something going on around uh, payments, uh, blockchain. I, I think that's fascinating. As a product person wearing that hat, and like, first of all, I want to use the product as I, because I, I like it, but I'm also curious to know how can you maintain a roadmap? First of all, collaborate with the product team to, to, to collaborate on the roadmap, but also make sure that you are allocating the right engineering resources to make sure that those initiatives have the right support while making sure that your core is also stable and, and thriving. Yeah, I mean, this has been this is a challenge for for any company because what you're really talking about is um, how do we make sure we don't fall into the innovators' dilemma trap? Right? We, we've got you know Twitter like has obviously has a, a really core business, <laughs> well functioning core business around tweeting stuff, and how much of our our energy investment should be put into these nonlinear bets? That that's sort of a there's not a one size fit all answers for that. It's, it's basically a process that occurs. Um, in, in planning, you have to un you do genuinely have to understand how much upside there is in your core business, and you also have to be able to weigh any of these high beta potential opportunities that we have. You know, a, a, a Twitter does this process once a quarter uh, and sort of looks at the across the portfolio of investments that we're making, where our, our people and resources are allocated, and then we do sort of a best effort sort of guess on the ROI of, of any of the investments. And, and those, when I say ROI, I mean like tied to business outcomes, like, you know, monetization or, or uh, DAU, like we, we try and tie it to, to some overarching business metric. Th things like spaces where there isn't necessarily a direct line to, toward existing business metrics, we have to play it a little bit more fuzzy and, uh, and, and that's okay because, um, that really is a new category and, and we're willing to, um, to operate with a little bit, being willing to, sorry, being willing to operate in that new category with the uncertainty is sort of an advantage in and of itself that other companies might not take. But, you know, once a quarter, look at your portfolio. Is it balanced the right way? People often, often, ask, what is the, often ask, what is the right portfolio balance? I, I think on the whole, you should obviously be doubling down on things that work. <laughs> so, you know, you, you know, as, as fun as like spaces and some of these new investments are like the majority of our uh, investment actually goes toward Twitter, like as, as it is. And then we carve out, um, you know, some percentage to, to go, uh, you know, tackle these news areas and hopefully those bets pay off and we'll double down and, and put more resourcing into them. So as, as you think about your own personal roadmap, uh, what are you curious about learning these days? Um, I guess there's uh, two things. Like I, I think uh, I kind of imply one of them, but like the, I started my career in machine learning and I started too early. <laughs> like it, it feels like machine learning now has really taken off uh, with um, deep learning models, tensor. Like when I, when I started, you know, you, you were building neural networks from the ground up. Like, you know, you have the hand code, like what a perceptron was. Uh, and, you know, now, you know, I can, now there's like ML as a service. Like I can literally, like, I could get off this call and go and get like a, a farm of like a hundred tensor, tensor, tensor machines and start training all sorts of, of, of wild things I would never have imagined, you know, even five years, five years ago. So I think ML is, uh, it's, it's even, it's at an inflection, it's beyond an inflection point. It's, it's really becoming amazing. And then the other one we just talked about, um, I, I something is happening with blockchain and Web three um, that um, 
I wish I understood it more. And, <laughs> you know, I, I think five years from now, it'll be clear what this all means, but th there's something genuinely happening here. I, I don't think it's, it, it's, it, there's a lot of sin. It's easy to be cynical about it because when you go and look into these things, it's people like buying and selling pictures of monkeys for like $300,000 like that. That's probably not where this market's going to end up <laughs> if I had to guess. Um, but um, I had a, a chat with uh, uh, Darmesh from uh, HubSpot. I'm on the board of HubSpot, which I guess I should have mentioned in the intro. But, um, and Darmesh gave a, a presentation about his view on Web3. And um, a, as an example, use case talked about how decentralized profiles could be used to replace uh, many of the problems that exist with companies like uh, social media companies like LinkedIn or, or even Twitter or, or, or Reddit, or anyone owning your profile information. And he explained it in a way where I finally understood like, oh yeah, I would actually, I would actually get value if such a, surface, a service existed. Um, there's other opportunities. I think Web3 is going to um, potentially uh, cause us to take more dependencies on open protocols for things like maybe uh, chat and direct messaging, which could have broader implications on the market. So there's something here that is beyond selling pictures of gorillas. I, I don't know exactly where it's going to end up, but it, it's worth, uh, it's worth looking into. And, um, you know, fortunately I can do my, my day job where we actually invest in some of these things. Uh, and then I'm on, on, on board and advisory roles, which allow me to you know participate in some of the, the discussions as well without having as much skin in the game. I still get to get to learn about it. I guess that's a, a bit of advice I would give to people leaving, uh, uh, listening, sorry, that, uh, you know, try and uh, don't try and um, get too trapped in your local company ecosystem that um, you should always have some some feelers or network into the outside world and uh, learning about other companies or other opportunities or other market trends in general, the more you can learn, the better and that your network in the long run is your net worth. So having more uh, access to these opportunities makes you smarter and it could bring more opportunities your way. Totally. And you can also bring those opportunities to your current company. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I, and I love how you're explaining that student mindset that you have, right? Like saying, I don't know this. I, I think there is something and, and you are investing time. Yeah, well, those. And, and I think that is the, the approach that I, I personally take and I, I encourage others to do because this is a journey and there's so many new things happening that it's just so easy to get stuck assuming that those things that made you successful today are, are just going to repeat. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, you're in management long enough, you, you learn that you have to depend on people. <laughs> <laughs> but being open to change is a huge thing. Like, you know, if you think about, uh, you know, Gosh, pick any technology uh, right now. Web tech seems to have a new framework every like six months. Uh, you know, the transformation in Kubernetes, we talked about ML, like the beauty of this industry is how quickly it changes. And you got to have some strategy for how you're going to uh, accommodate that. So Nick, what are some of the, the things that you still do that don't scale, but you, you love so much that it's important to, to continue investing some time? Um, I think for, for me, um, I've, I've always been very passionate about management and people development and organizational design. So even to this day, my org now is like 750 something people. I don't, I don't know. A bunch of people work for me, but um, the main thing is uh, I still like to do one-on-ones like pretty deep into the org when I can, when people are willing to talk to me, i learned so much from just talking to like software engineer ones and twos. I mean, those are some of my favorite conversations. Um, and then team meetings as well. Like I'll go pretty deep into the org and just have, you know, pretty open conversation with people on the team. This, this doesn't scale at all. And, you know, it can be pretty intimidating if it's not set up in the right way, because I guess if a lot of people work for you, you no longer are treated like a, a regular person, but I am a regular person. I like meeting people. So, so it doesn't scale, but I, I learned so much in those conversations. Um, you know, I always tell people in these meetings that, um, all this, all this, all the really knowledgeable, smart people who know what is actually happening in the org are at the bottom of the org chart. <laughs> so if, if you don't have mechanisms to funnel funnel that up to leadership to make better decisions, then something's broken. And um, you know, I use these kind of one on ones and team team syncs not just to meet people, but to genuinely like change how I think about operating the business. I, I just reminded me of a framework that I read many years ago that talks about the. Leather, level of incompetence like someone grows up to the organization as as much as their level of incompetence <laughs> <laughs> the peter peter principle yeah <laughs> um so my last question to you is about you know 
advice to your younger self? Obviously, uh, I'm sure that throughout your career, you've learned different things and uh, things that you would like to repeat, things that you would probably not want to repeat. So what if, uh, you were to summarize something for that younger person who's there thinking about breaking into product, what would you say? Yeah, sure. Um, let me see. Wow. Yeah. My younger self was a, a bit of a hellion breaking all kinds of rules. So uh, I would tell them, um, well, there's a couple of things like uh, younger Nick, uh, like you should learn to get out of your comfort zone. So I spent 15 years at Microsoft. And I think I mentioned this earlier, but like I learned a lot at Microsoft, but I, I learned an enormous amount when I finally decided to like break out of that ecosystem and and, uh, you know, I moved to the Bay Area. I don't think that's to be a that extreme for people. But, um, you know, I was at Microsoft because I was very, very comfortable and good at that job. And, you know, I, I told you all my background was uh, PG, growing up in PG County, Maryland. My parents were were poor. They, they made, sorry, not poor. I said lower middle class. I don't know what the line is, but my parents were both public servants. So we had relatively little income. And when I got my first job at Microsoft, I was making more than both of them combined. So there was sort of an economic uh, motivation, and plus my job was good, and you know, I stayed in that that place far longer than I, I should have because I had gotten comfortable, and I was also a little bit afraid of trying something new. And when I finally worked up the courage through like all sorts of mechanisms, <laughs> which I'll in a, in some other talk I you know cover, when I finally you know was able to jump and, and go to to do something new, I really started to learn a lot. I really started to. To, to get access to some great opportunities. So, um, you know, just try and uh, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Second one is um, like the job ladder only serves you up to a point. And um, similar to how I just talked about being locked into one company's ecosystem, don't lock your mindset into a job ladder. Like you're, you're, you're a job ladder is a one company artifact that helps frame career progression for that company and its culture. And if you take two different companies and stack their job ladders up next to each other, there'll be different things on it. So you need to learn that like these are constructs created to help a particular company. You know, you should not wedge yourself in your mentality to, to, to that. And a better way to think about navigating your, your job ladder, if you do want to call it that, is to think about all the skills and people and, and all of the uh, experiences that you want to have in your career. And then try and navigate to those. And then insofar as the job ladder lines up with that and, and helps you good, uh, but don't use it as a, a, a limitation on your things you want to do and, and opportunities you might pursue. Or even like, don't even use it as a, as a, a, a way to, uh, uh, to uh, value your self-worth. That, that's the worst. Uh, if you use some company's job ladder construct and you start you know, using it to uh, to measure your own self worth. That that's not the way to think about your career advancement. Um, and I guess the final two, uh, you know, managers don't manage your career. You have to remember that managers, you know, first and foremost are, man are managing your workload. So, um, you know, they it's great when they also can can break out of that mold and think about helping you with career opportunities. But you know, you should spend your time and energy also thinking about how to look for opportunities, how to network, etc. Uh, and don't put so much of that um, expectation on your on your manager. You have to manage your own career. So that's what I would tell young uh, young Nick uh, as he caused so much trouble in the world. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure to learn with you. Oh, awesome! Thanks, y'all. Hope y'all enjoyed it.